Jacob bogeys and fouling points. Take a little snooze on the sandbox. Wink wildly at the wayside objects. And encase your lead-lined coffin in several tons of concrete so that your wealthy corpse won't be desecrated by those damn labor activists. Hold on to that sweet caboose. It's time to talk tall to me. Choo-choo! Trains. Trains. Nick, welcome back. I am Owen Thomas Sade. <laughs> and as you secretly alluded to, I am Nick McGill. Together we are the Feckless Moans. And this, my sweet choo-choos, is Talk Told to Me. An unsanctioned meeting in the company town of Prague Rock, in which narrow-gauge Nick and out-to-foul Omen will send signals down the shoe-fly of every single track that runaway rock band Jethro Tull have ever connected to the electric third rail. We will diffuse the moose from the Jerry Conway caboose. We will pray over the power piston on David Pegg's pony truck. And we will bail off the boom barrier for Martin Barr's bubble car. And if we can tune out the noise of the Coco Locomoto and find a comfortable position for our cylinder cocks, we may finally go to sleep, perchance to dream, of the leaping light engine, the rotary romancer, the travel-weary treadle, the supercharged Scotsman, the flying junction flautist, Ian Axelbox Anderson, unless I said Axelbox last time. In which case, Ian Ashpan Anderson. Definitely didn't say that one. I don't know. I don't know. You got options. It's up to you now. That's great. I'll wash my hands of this. So I need to go back and listen to any song that even potentially had something to do with trains? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can. I, let's just use Ashpan. Nick, okay. welcome again back to the podcast. I've been here all week waiting for you. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher Walken. It's great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I am really excited to dive into this episode. Of course, we are still on the Broadsword bonus tracks. That's right. And after several weeks of diving into some instrumentals, we finally get to talk about a track with lyrics. Yeah, here we are. We are half, we're technically halfway through all of these brand new bonus tracks. Even though we've only had two episodes, we're four episodes in, and then we've got four more, starting with Inverness Sleeper, which is dreadfully exciting. It's really nice... We've had the, those two weeks of like, this is this is the sound, the the oral experience of Broadsword. And now we get that kind of, that vocal experience of Broadsword. And let's be clarifying of what we are to say. There are some 80 tracks, 81 tracks, right. in fact, that have been released by Steve Wilson. But many of those, in fact, most of those are songs that we have already covered. Right. The remasters, the first like dozen, I think, are the remasters. Then we have some live versions and just some studio demo versions and things like that. Some stuff that's found on, oh gosh, what's on? Uh, Nightcap, I think, the second disc yeah. of Nightcap. You'll see yes. a lot of those too. Yeah, And some songs that were found in the pocket of an old trench coat abandoned at the coat check of Paddington Station. And someone pulled it out of the lost and found and, and found that and... um they could have ransomed it for a lot, but they gave it back to Ian for, for the sake of all mankind. Who now can marry Lady Bracknell's ward. Is that a part of the importance of being earnest? Yeah, yeah. He finds, what's he find in a, in... No, he was, he was found. Oh, 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 he was. Okay. I was like, what, what did they yeah. find? Okay, I get it now. They end up, they're brothers at the end. Yeah, hot. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, Oscar Wilde. So oh, good. Oscar Wilde. So saucy he is. So, without much further inclement weather moments, shall we take Correct. a listen to Inverness Sleeper? Let's just drop a little disclaimer here. Speaking of inclement weather, Omen is in the throes, in the paroxysms of Hurricane Adalia. Is that her name? Is that the name? Adalia? I only ever call her. Your Majesty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Omen just, as soon as we got on the, the camera, as soon as we started recording, 
rain started hitting his window. So And me, through the window. Through the window, right, right. So just brace yourself if you hear pitter-patter of rain. I have my windows open and it's nice and cool and the sun is out and you'll hear crickets and maybe the blue jay will come back and yell at me and uh, traffic. But it's the tail end of the summer. Clearly it's autumn already. And uh, yeah. Oh, I have a theory. I have a theory. <laughs> I'm sorry, really divergent. No, you know what? We'll save it for the halfway. Completely unrelated, but we don't have anything halfway, so we'll save it. I have a theory too. Maybe I already told you. Should we save that for halfway as well? Sure. If we remember it. If we remember it. Okay. Uh, yes. How about we listen? How about we, we fall asleep to Inverness Sleeper? Sleeper? I hardly know her. You brought her... You sleeper. There it is. There it is. Nick McGill. Roman said. <sighs> there we have Inverness sleeper. Now, before we dive in, what's Inverness? It is a city in Scotland. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's great. That's great. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> Where in Scotland is it? It is in the Scottish Highlands. Oh. oh it, and it was only granted city status in 2000. Oh, Inverness is coming up in the world. Congratulations. And in that city granting, they cited this song. Did they really? Nope. I made that up just now. Okay. That's a bummer. It is now regarded as the capital of the Highlands. Wow. Mm -hmm. I wonder what that entails. Being the capital of the Highlands? Yes. Probably a lot of caber tournaments. Caber tossing tournaments. Yeah. Probably the prettiest castle in all of the Highlands, maybe. And the prettiest cows. Those are some pretty cows. They, I've always said Inverness has the prettiest cows. Inverness cattle. The prettiest. The prettiest. The warmest. <laughs> the gentlest of lovers. <laughs> you gaze into their eyes, and you name Mary never gaze into a lady's <laughs> eyes the same again. <laughs> well, now wow. that, that we have that out of the way. Offensive. What is a sleeper? A sleeper is someone who sleeps. <laughs> nah, it's a, I'm assuming it's a sleeper car, yes? Well, I... I I'm assuming it's not sleeper agent. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've been waiting here. Oh, I've been dressed as a cow for the last 30 <laughs> years to attack. I think it's the sleeper car. It's a sleeper car, to. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Correct. More of that to come. Nick, let's talk about the music. What are the sounds that enter our ears when we listen to this track? Oh, goodness. We have some delightful sounds. We've got your mandos. We've got your acoustics. We've got very tisky drums, a uh, very chunky bass. Prominent. Pro very prominent. I believe synth comes in at about 1.30 as well. Yes, it does. Unlike mandolin setting, I believe. Or possibly horn. It's hard to tell, oh, but, de <laughs> but definitely on synth setting. Yeah, full on synth. It's so lovely and beautiful and sweet and soft and melodic. And it's been a long time since we've heard something like this. And it's very refreshing. It's got all of the folk elements that we love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's got mixed in there some really great rock elements. Yeah, It's got a wistful morning type of quality to it, which is a delight. Mm-hmm and provides charm. Yeah. And it's about one of our favorite topics. Trains. Trains! Trains. By virtue of being Ian's favorite, it is our favorite. Exactly. Exactly. So, time signatures, Nick. There are some. I think there may be just one, actually. <gasps> Dear God. I know. Uh, is it 4-4? Four, four? Nope. Is it three, four? Possibly, but I think it's six, eight. 
Tick a tick a tick a one, two, three, two, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, six. Bum, dum, dum, dum. Ah, okay, yeah. Tick a tick a dum, 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 tick a tick a dum. So I think it's in six, eight. It's at least in threes. Okay. You could count it in four, which would be very awkward, but it would match up when you got 12 in. So if you wanted to do that, you could. <laughs> That's how I do things here. Yes, yeah. awkwardly. and <laughs> Awkward and just a moment of comfort. <laughs> and then it gets awkward again. <laughs> At great expense to myself. <laughs> and at the convenience of no one. Yes, right, right. Not worth it at all. What we do have is, you mentioned it already, some lovely mandolin work. Mm -hmm. tiki, 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 tiki. Yeah, very plucky. But we've also got a layer of like strummy guitar, mando. I think there's guitar and mando on there. Is or maybe it's just guitar really high up, because there's there's a part there where where you've got this kind of this solid layer, this solid wall of acoustic sound. And then on top of that, we've also got specific of the, the picking of the Mando. Of those engines humming. It is interesting. It's like all the string instruments are playing it yeah. al almost in unison. So you get this really deep, rich, you have the bass going along in the same rhythm. You have the mandolin. I think there's an electric guitar in there as well. I don't know if there is an acoustic guitar. There may be no acoustic guitar in this. Really? I know it's definitely happening at about 55 where you've got chicka 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 going on while also the the noodle of the mando is going on top of that. But it's also like the tisk of the the cymbal on top of that as well. Of those engines humming. Yeah, I think it's I think you're right. I think it's double mando, bass, maybe some electric thrown in there, but no acoustic guitar. And I think I think cymbal might be on there as well. But they're all doing that chicka chicka chick all of them at the same time. They're there's that stacked dagwood of a sandwich while other stuff is going on on top of that. It's crazy. It's it's such a unique thing to have everybody kind of playing the same thing is really like a very solid back to the song. I enjoy the sound of this very much. It's very nice. It seems at once upbeat, but also down tempo. <laughs> yeah, right. Because it has those sections like dum, ba dum, mm -hmm. ba dum. But then over top of it, you have the tick 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 It has a sense of movement and uh, liminality. Does it now? Liminality. Delicious. Or liminality. You know, the, it's my older cousin. It's a citronality. Yeah. There's a sweeping quality here. Yes. With the music and particularly with Ian's singing. Mm. We don't have that a lot. Even in the earlier stuff, it's not like, oh, we just haven't heard it in Zealot Jean and Rock Flute. He doesn't really kind of sweep with his lyrics a whole lot. But this one, he's just kind of like, Da, 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 da. This is also at an earlier age when he had a little bit more leeway with his breath support. Yes. He's also singing a lot higher than we've heard in recent albums because of course. Right. He's definitely in prime of breath support and range for sure. I definitely don't get any strain here. He feels very comfortable in, in his delivery. Very comfortable. Yes. Yeah. This is, uh, well, we'll get into it, but I do think that this is a little bit of the Going home song, the going, the return to the Highlands song. Trains, subheading, going to the Highlands, which is why it's a sleeper car, because that's a very long journey. I just looked it up. It's 10 hours by car. It's 10 hours now, right? So it may have even been longer on a sleeper train. It may, you know. Oh, it's 12 hours by train now. Wow. Yeah. So that's a long journey. It sure is. One that you will most likely want to sleep in during at some point. I have the option of it, at least. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. And simultaneously, Inverness may not have or may not have had an airport. Yeah, that's true. That may have been your only option to getting to Inverness. Yeah. I don't know what the air infrastructure is like, aerostructure is like out there. One thing that's that's noteworthy about the air infrastructure is that it's it's usually two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom together. That's it? Uh, what am I talking about? That's water. <laughs> they do stuff really simple over there that they just don't bother with air. 
they just have water in the ocean and <laughs> that's what they breathe. I did, you know, you've been to the UK. I haven't, so I can't, I can't question you. I have to trust you. <laughs> <laughs> this weather has really thrown me off. Yeah, water. You're surrounded by water. Yeah, I get it. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Let's talk about, okay, at 107, we have an amazing change to the chord structure, which really dips us into more of that feeling of getting into our feelings. Is it a key change? It gets brighter. I don't know if it's necessarily a key change. Inverness. I don't think it's a change of the whole key, but I think it's a different set of chords. Mm. It's like a bridge within the song that allows you to express a different scale. Okay. It gets brighter. It definitely gets brighter. You're talking about the Inverness sleeper part, right? Where he... Sleeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. It's a good one. It's interesting. I, I find it to be more melancholy at that moment. But orally, it's brighter. I feel like it gets to a brighter sound. Yes. <laughs> Did you get a haircut? No. It looks good today. I like the pompadour. Today? Today it looks good? Oh, Wow. Thanks. Genuinely. I just won't comment. I won't comment at all ever again. No, I, uh, let's no, see I you shrivel up like a plant that never gets watered. I appreciate, I, I do, <laughs> I do live on praise for my hair. Um, no, I, I thank you so much. I, I've been, um, I've actually been not blow drying it. Hmm. And it looks like there's less product in it. I think normally you put, a, put more product in it. I've been using a different product since oh. the summer. So it, lo it looks more natural, at least. I think so. Yeah, I like it. I don't, I don't like a slick. I don't like a grease. No, especially if you look like me, the difference between like sleek and looking like a weasel that fell into an oil trap is yeah. really, really a fine line. You tow it. Yeah, you tow that line. For I sure. tow that line. Yeah. Oh, what am I doing in your oil trap? Hey, <laughs> get me out of here. I have my toe. It fell in. <laughs> <laughs> I was just looking for some grubs, eh? <laughs> Oily grubs. <laughs> <sighs> Did you get the text like right before we started to listen to yes. Commercial Traveler? So the first second of this song, The Sting, I heard it and I was like, what is that? What does that remind me of? What is? What do I think of there? And then you listen to every single Jethro Tull song. I actually was able to, to pinpoint it a lot more quickly than I usually can. Nice. And it's the acoustic version of that opening sting, I think. It, it very, it's very reminiscent to it of Commercial Traveler, yeah. It's very similar. I think what the, because it's not the same key. No. And it's not the same instrumentation. <laughs> completely different. <laughs> it's not the same notes, but what is the same about it is that it has a, it's the same strumming pattern. Yeah. It's that bum. Yeah. Kind of done by the bass. Mm, okay. So it's got the same rhythm of pluckage. Okay. Your standard pluckage rhythm. It's the same plumage. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely reminded me of that. And it only took a couple of tries to, to find it. And the more I listen to it, the more I'm like, okay, I see differences here, but it's still like on that very first listen, it's like, oh yeah, that's what it is. And I think that all artists go through phases of playing with the same rhythms, reusing rhythms. Oh yeah. It's certainly not like, like, oh, well there, here comes this one again, you know, like it's, right. it's very well done and it's unique. You don't terribly hear like pom and then get into the song. You know, we've heard it twice in the, how many episodes have we done of, of this would be three. This is episode number three. This is episode number 245. I was close. So we've heard about 250 plus tall songs now. We've heard it twice, you know, and this one isn't even mainstream and commercial. You know what? Commercial Traveler wasn't even mainstream. That was a no, bonus track too. It was. Yeah. And... I also think that when we listen to Inverness Sleeper, 
I can understand why it wasn't included on the full album. To me, there's a sense, and I genuinely think this is one of the coolest songs that we've heard in a long time, just, you know, of its uniqueness and its style and its, and its theme and everything. Mm-hmm. I find that it takes, and maybe it's my listening ability, but I feel like it takes a minute for the rhythm to solidify in the beginning. Hmm. Let me listen to it, just that opening. I retract my statement. It's perfect, but because it's unusual, it takes the ear a minute to catch up with it. Yeah, there's, on first listen, it, it doesn't sound like it should to be busy, but it kind of feels busy. Like we're, we're on off beats and off counts and measures, right? Yes, I think it tricks you into th- thinking that it should be in 4-4. Four, four, mm. And then where that dicka 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 down is, seems like it's in the wrong spot Mm -hmm. until your ear adjusts to the fact that it's in three, four or six, eight. Right. And then you're like, oh, well now they're playing it right. Well, yeah, no, in actuality, you are now accustomed to it. It's funny. You were listening to it wrong. They have (laughs) always been playing it right. (laughs) Always the correct assumption to make when talking about Jethro Tull. 1000%. Yes, absolutely. Let's talk about the synth that comes in at about 130, you said. So fun. I definitely agree with the horn sound now, but I I thought it was initially a synth sound because I think there's a little vibrato, which in turn mixes with the vibrato of the tremulo of the mando at that exact same time. So it sounded like it was doing that. I mean, it's undeniably the synth and it's not a very convincing horn sound. Remember this is 1981 or 82, I believe. Yeah. So early days for synth believability when it comes to it replicating other instruments. Right. But it adds something really funny to it. It adds a sense of adventure, a sense of nobility, perhaps. I think 1981 synth can be a kind of approached like you would approach the Nintendo entertainment system. Yes. Versus the Xbox 360 now, the Xbox One, you know, like in 1990, when the Nintendo came out, it was mind blowing. In 97 or 8 or whenever the the N64 came out, those graphics were ridiculously good. Mm -hmm. And then you look at it now and it's just polygons and cardboard boxes walking around and it's ridiculous. Yeah. But you, you, so in the moment, I I bet you that sounded pretty damn cool. I agree. And I think it still sounds cool. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was, I was telling you that I got all these uh, cassette tapes. Oh, yeah, right. And one of them that I slightly regret, or at least an, am embarrassed to have got and listened to, is called Sunday Morning Coffee 2. L- l- can I see the, the picture of it? Can I see the front of it? Chip Davis Day Parts? Yeah. <laughs> it looks like, is it like smooth jazz? What is it? Jazz would be a a generous term. Based on that cover, like, it sounds like it would be kind of okay. You know, it's difficult to know, you know? I bet you that's not even on Spotify. I wonder if it is. Look up Chip Davis. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Chip Davis. What's regrettable about it? What's regrettable about it is that it is, uh, it was recorded and released in 90, in 1993, and it is, um, I would call it smooth schlock. When it has the synthesizer, it's like, it's just the worst. It's not, it hadn't gotten to the point where synth was believable. And it was too far away from the point where synth was innovative. Are you listening to it right now? No. Chip Davis is apparently from Mannheim Street Steamroller, which is very synthy. Oh. He has an album called Mannheim Steamroller Meets the Mouse, which is basically Mannheim Steamroller doing Disney songs. <laughs> Let's do Hakuna Matata. Oh, this is so Mannheim Steamroller. Oh, the the buildup. (laughs) 
Oh, come on. Oh, it's it's not great. It's not, it, that's better than what I've listening to. I want to read you the introduction to this um, cassette tape. Please do. On Sunday mornings, I like to sit in my sunroom, drink coffee, read the paper, and listen to music. I particularly like to listen to an eclectic mix of styles in a constant mood. Since I'm so picky, <laughs> in a constant mood. <laughs> since I'm so picky and have a great. St- Stable of composers on hand, I savagely asked them to participate in a concept album to make Sunday Morning Coffee 2 a unique, relaxing, and pleasurable event. If you have a particular interest in one piece or another, just fill out the enclosed postcard or call 1-800-446-6860 and we'll send you a product sheet from their other products. Enjoy. Cheap. <laughs> And no, for those not not watching the video, which you can if you do fifteen dollars a month at, at Feckless Mumps Patreon, Elman was holding the little like what like two by three yeah, by two square cassette. of of a cassette tape yeah, liner the notes. Fold out, yeah, the fold out. Yeah. Oh, it's been a long time since I had one. Is that the the enclosed postcard? Yes. You should send it. I thought of it. You can also get one pound of American Grandma coffee. <laughs> And get a discount for having bought the album. Wow. I wonder if that offer is still on. Yeah, but the Grandma Coffee is from 1992. <laughs> it's the same <laughs> coffee. Vintage coffee. Okay, so we have nothing. Was that thunder or was that you moving something? It was my butt. Oh, okay. Uh, we have nothing for correspondence or anything right now. So... I want to throw out a, a theory that Raven is very much does not buy into at all. This is a, a Raven not approved theory. As most are, yeah. <laughs> I think we've discussed this before. Do you know what a tulpa is? A tulpa. Tulpa, T-U-L-P-A, tulpa. Is it one of those things that the ancient rabbis used to make? Am I getting warm? Does it involve ancient rabbis? It probably does. I don't know its its original origin. It pro- I would not be surprised at all. Is it a Yiddish word? Does it involve Judaism? I don't know that either. I mean, I'm thinking present day tulpa. Then I do not know what a tulpa is. Okay. So a tulpa is something that comes into fruition and existence based on belief alone. If enough people believe in it, it exists. Like, like my height. Like you're right. I believe you are above five feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just need another hundred thousand people. <laughs> believe and clap your hands. So you could say Slender Man is a tulpa. Is a tulpa? Sure, sure, sure. Because people have done things in the name of Slender Man. Sure, sure. So my theory is that the seasons turning earlier and earlier is essentially a tulpa like i've got yellow leaves on my trees already and it's the end of august i feel like that's very very early for leaves turning on trees my theory is because home depot and lowe's and walmart and everybody is putting out halloween stuff right now the overall mindset is oh it's autumn now and it's making it happen yeah we went and got the new pumpkin cold cream chai latte from Starbucks this past weekend. Yeah, and you contributed three leaves turned yellow because of that. Because of me. No, you're totally right. Yeah, I'm not sure what your theory is, but I'm sure that I agree with it. <laughs> that because capitalism is forcing us to experience Halloween decorations earlier and earlier, the season is trying to catch up. What I heard is capitalism is to blame, and I couldn't agree more if you Perfect. paid me to. <laughs> Can you? I have bills. <laughs> Are you familiar with the notion of the, the Christmas singularity? I'm sure I've talked with you about this before. I think so. That, yeah, go, go for it. I could not explain it well enough. If I believe you have, though. As you've mentioned, Home Depot and Target and whatnot— will put out Christmas decorations earlier and earlier and earlier. You, every year, Christmas music is played on the radio earlier and earlier and earlier. Right. So by logical extension, there will come a point when 
the Christmas decorations for next year are put up before the Christmas decorations for this year have been taken down. Meaning yeah. that we will have reached a Christmas singularity where every day of the year is Christmas or getting ready for in the Christmas season. It's the same day where you're in dueling mindsets of, oh, I really need to take down those decorations. Oh shit, I really need to put up those decorations. And you're just in this internal struggle. <laughs> it's the opposite of what the Ice Queen in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe created. She created always winter, never Christmas. What we're creating with capitalism is always Christmas, but never winter. Yeah, right. Was that your theory? You said you had a, a different theory. No, my theory was about time signatures. Oh, let's talk about that, because that's even even remotely re <laughs> related to this so, freaking podcast. At some point, we were thinking about, you know, why is it that 4-4 four, four is such a, is a literally common time signature? I think we did talk about this. Yeah, 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 we did. It's We have two feet. People can dance, yeah. People can dance to it. Yeah, well, people can some, dance. Some people can dance to it. Not me. I, I refuse. Yeah. I refuse. I subscribe to the Footloose way of life. <laughs> The pre-Kevin Bacon Footloose way of life. Pre-Kevin Bacon? Is there a pre-Kevin Bacon Footloose? Yeah, the town. Oh, oh, before Kevin Bacon shows up. Oh, okay. I thought you were like a version of Footloose before Kevin Bacon was in it. <laughs> Isn't the town itself called Footloose? Oh, I don't know. I've never seen the film. <laughs> I don't think the town is called Footloose. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Welcome to Footloose, Missouri. Don't dance. Don't dance, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Nick, let's talk about Inverness Sleeper. Yes, let's talk lyrics. We've covered Inverness and we've covered Sleeper. What? How? Ha? Huh, buh? Your intro. Your intro. Your triptych. How does that fit into our theme here? Trains. Was it trains? No, that was train stuff. Bury your lead-lined casket in concrete. Oh! So, <laughs> so, if we're talking about the sleeper car, we must okay. talk about the capitalist who gained a lot of profit from the sleeper car. Mr. I'm trying to get his first name. I bet you could guess it. I bet you could guess his last name. Harold Sleeper. George M. Pullman. Mm, yeah. A New Yorker who made a lot of money on the railroad and traveled frequently on the railroad for work. This was during a time, this was uh, sort of before the American Civil War to post-Civil War era. He was traveling on the rapidly growing rail system quite a lot and found that it was very uncomfortable. It was a very unpleasant experience. Mm, yeah, I can only imagine back then. Sure. There were sleeper cars, but they were like, oh, let's stick some beds in here and hang a hammock. And they were, <laughs> they were very, you know, thrown together and not really very comfortable. Yeah. So he created, he created one. He, he persuaded one of the rail companies to let him convert two of, the, uh, of his cars. And in 1859, the Pullman Sleepers came about and they were a huge success uh, and then he he started manufacturing them during the civil war he like other wealthy men of his era hired someone to take his place in the war right that's the american way my friend because money can buy you anything after the civil war he had a big uh publicity moment in the train that was carrying Lincoln's body back to Springfield, Illinois, he managed to include a couple of sleeper cars. So everyone who came out to see the Lincoln funeral. Wow. To see the Lincoln train go by. saw, oh, hey, what's that thing? That's huh. so gross. Yep. Hey, hey, you want to make $5? Go get shot. Oh, and by the way, go <laughs> sleep in this. <laughs> go sleep in this. He also, once his company really took off and he, he wanted a factory where he built his factory in Illinois, the living situation, he needed a bunch of workers and there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of housing. And so he created a town that he called Pullman. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Purchased 4,000 acres next to near Lake Calumet in the south side of Chicago. It was, by all accounts, a pretty nice place to live in comparison to some of the other places that were around. But it was strictly hierarchical. So if you were mm. a high-wage employee, you would get a house to yourself. If you were a day laborer, you'd shack up in a room with six other guys. 
Yeah. There were no Which, public meetings. For some, that sounds fun. <laughs> Don't tempt me with a good time. <laughs> I, I'll gladly take a low wage. <laughs> Mr. Pullman. <laughs> Are these benefits? <laughs> Or no, no, no. I thought you said this job had no benefits. There we go. <laughs> I've pulled a man. <laughs> there were shopping areas, churches, theaters, parks, and a library. And his idea was that if you took the labor away from agitators, labor agitators, unionists. Yeah, right, right. As well as bars, red light districts and everything, they would produce a productive and happy workforce. Well, Eventually, over time, what happened is what happens with every company town. He kept raising the prices on the rent because you had mm. to rent the rooms to live there. And so if I was working in Pullman and you were the paymaster and it was payday, you would come to me and you have two checks for me. One would be a check pre-made out of what I owed you oh my God. for my rent, which I would yep. fill out and give mm -hmm. right back to you. And yep. the other check would be what's left over that I got to keep. And over time with the depression, yeah, it wasn't worth it to work there anymore. And people started unionizing. And he literally was so mad at the unions and unionizing efforts that he had himself encased in concrete so that the unionists couldn't get to his corpse. Boy. Yeah. Just like, just human decency. That's all. Yeah. Anyway, so. Okay, so that, that explains... That part of the triptych. Got it. Trains. Okay. Trains. Sleepers, specifically sleepers. So, so this song is actually kind of a sweetie pie over here, isn't it? It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a lovely song. Wide awake down at Houston Station for the 850 train to get me out of here. Wide awake down at Houston Station. For the train to get me out of here out of london yep to inverness up to the highlands can you feel the beat of those engines humming can you hear the howl as the long black night appears can you feel the beat of those engines humming can you hear the howl as the long So if it's 8.50, presumably that's 8.50 p.m. Yeah. Inverness sleeper, I lay awake with you till dawn. Inverness sleeper, oh, carry me on. Inverness sleeper, I lay awake with you till dawn. Inverness sleeper, oh, carry me on. So this is where... Like you said, it has kind of a sweet element to it. I think it's hilarious that it's called Inverness Sleeper and it's a song about staying up all night. Right, right. But it's also, the you is ambiguous. So it's either like, I'm with my sweetheart and we're in the Inverness Sleeper and we're laying awake, or boy, this train is freaking uncomfortable. I'm laying awake in the Inverness Sleeper until dawn. My read on it is that he's so excited to be on a train that he just can't sleep. <laughs> Ian's in his footy pajamas, just like so, just like wired in bed. Like, yep, covers up to his chin. Martin, did you hear the engine? <laughs> yes, Ian, it's a train. <laughs> oh, listen, cha -chung, cha -chung, cha -chung. Oh, this is where we slow down because we're going through the Highlands. I know, Ian. I know, Ian. <laughs> Put on your sleep mask. <laughs> Foxed and blind in rattling dungeon on a timeless flight to maybe Lord knows where. Foxed and blind. In a rattling dungeon On a timeless flight to maybe Lord knows where So this is evidence to support the idea that maybe it's not the most comfortable, maybe it's not a Pullman. You're not sleeping well unless you're sleeping in a Pullman. You're not pulling a man unless you're sleeping with Pullman. With a Pullman. <laughs> And I love this idea of what the next line expresses. For me, this is the kind of heart of the song. You can just believe there's no destination, no engine driver sitting up there. You can just believe there's no destination. No engine driver sitting. 
this idea of a journey where you're like, I get this ticket, I know where I'm departing from, I know where I'm going, I'm going to get in this mode of transportation. And then at a certain point, this space of liminality overtakes your senses. And you're like, I don't even know. Right. I don't even know, dude. Yeah, the timeless flight. I mean, if it's a 12 hour train ride, you know, it's very easy, particularly, I mean, even back in 81, you had a wristwatch and that's it. You don't have a constant source of time. You'll fall into that. And especially with something that has its own rhythm, like the chugging of the train, yeah. the rolling, rattling of the wheels. It's very easy to kind of lose your your head there. And I think it's kind of a romantic thing, but it's also kind of like a head gamey thing of just like, ooh, the, I'm in a train forever. When I lived in Chicago, I would often take the Amtrak mm -hmm. back and forth from usually Syracuse or sometimes New York City to Chicago. And that's about a 12 hour trip. Yeesh. Mm -hmm. And nonstop. Or would you hit other stations? I mean, imagine you would, right, for the Amtrak? There were a couple of other stations. There was Syracuse, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo. And then after that, I don't think there was anything. Maybe Erie? What else is up there? Yeah. It didn't stop in Gary. I think it used to. I think it, we would pass by the Gary train station, but it was completely abandoned. Tumbleweeds, kids with f flick knives. <laughs> yeah, graffiti. <laughs> yeah. And at a certain point, and it usually was an overnight train, I'd usually get on at about eight o'clock at night and get there at yeah. about nine in the morning, let's say. And it was always, you know, I was it was not a sleeper car situation, couldn't afford it. Yeah. But it had nice reclining seats. And if you got a whole row to yourself, it was fairly comfortable. But you, you yeah. always kind of got into that state of half sleep, half dozing. My strategy would always be to bring a vodka with me and download some kung fu films. And you didn't have your noise canceling headphones at that point either. So, no, just the little ones on sticks, the shady little earbuds. Yeah. Yeah. So I can relate a little bit to that sense of like, yeah, I'm on this train. I know it's going somewhere, but at the same time, is my life going anywhere? <laughs> right. And also, that brings up a good point that after that specific length of distance, you know, you don't know where the next station is. You don't care where the next station is as long as you get to where you're going. So who gives a shit where's af what's after Rochester? I don't know where we're going, but I do know where we'll end up. Right. You're kind of in this like, I know I left here. I know I'm arriving here. I could be going and corkscrews up in Spain for 12 hours. It doesn't matter, you know? <laughs> I mean, maybe it does if you want to do that. <laughs> I think there's also... Like you said, you only have your wristwatch, maybe some novels, probably your notebook. There were no cell phones. Yeah. Maybe in 82, had the Walkman come out yet? The cassette tape Walkman? It's possible. Ian being an early adopter of technology, maybe. Maybe. He had a bagpipe past the time. <laughs> yep. Yep. But you have limited options to while away the hours. Right. You're at the mercy of whether or not the cafe car is open, whether or not they are stocked. And so you do have a lot of time to reflect. Walkman was out in 79. Okay, so, so he, could have, he could have had a Walkman. It's possible, yeah. More likely he was simply listening to his thoughts. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Flip to side B. And now more thoughts. <laughs> Inverness Sleeper, I lay awake with you till dawn. Inverness Sleeper, oh, carry me on. Inverness. That's basically the rest of it. Oh, carry me on. Oh, carry me on. Oh, carry me on. Yeah. You know, when you drive, you are in control, let's hope, in control of your vehicle. In control of your functions, your bowels, and your vehicle. Yes. If you're on a train. You don't have to be in control of any of those. <laughs> and you can't be. Otherwise, yeah. they call you a terrorist and ask you not to ride again. Yeah, that's true. Wait a minute. You are still in control of your bowels. You, you are? You've been riding trains wrong, haven't you? <laughs> very wrong. No wonder they get very upset. I do think there's a sense of surrender. You have to surrender to this huge object. Even a plane is a little bit different. You know, it's a smaller scale. In a train, it's, it is like a little microcosm that's being carried along in the world. Mm -hmm. And you get to look out, you know, look out the windows and see the trees go by. And Yeah, right. 
from a remove, you can still experience the world. Whereas like a plane, you can look out and see clouds and maybe like a little postage stamp of a, of a town or something. But there's this weird disconnect there that you are in your own little, your own little world. I love this song, Nick. It's really good. It's really, really good. It's a very sweet take on the train song. And uh, musically, I really, I really dig it. It's really, really nice. It's sweet. You hit the nose on that nail. Yeah, I did. I sure did. Ouch. You said that from a distance, train travel is very romantic, but actually doing it is probably a bit of a pain in the ass. In practicality. Although Ian friggin' loves a train, so I'm sure he was just having a gay old time. But a long train journey like this, I think, is the sort of thing that when we when we were listening to the song, we're like, ah, oh, the Inverness sleeper. Oh, mm-hmm. what a beautiful trip up to Scotland. And if you're doing it for the 12th time, yeah, you're like, God damn it. I wish there was just a, <laughs> somebody invent a fast, hot air balloon or something. <laughs> a jet air balloon. It's a balloon. You fill it up like a regular balloon, but then you let the stopper out and you go. Right. And you just hope you land in the right spot. Schnick, what else are we schnocking about, Schnick? Schnick. Possibly the best title in any Jethro Tull song. Really? I haven't listened to it yet. I really hope the lyrics hold up to the the sound of it. We're talking about me dinosaur. Me, comma, dinosaur. Me, dinosaur. Like I, Claudius. Possibly, or who did this? A dinosaur asking who did this. You say, me, dinosaur. (laughs) But not... That's me, dinosaur. Right, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, excited to talk about that next week. I'm sure it will be positively paleontological. Paleolithic. Thank you. Yes. Until next week, I will lay awake with you till dawn. I am Nick McGill. I'm boxed and blind in a rattling dungeon, Omen Thomas said. Can you hear the beat of those engines humming? That's the beat of Talk Tall to Me. And that howl... In the long black night that appears, it's the Feckless Moms. Midnight snack cart, midnight snack cart, get your midnight snacks here. Halfway to Inverness. We've got honey roasted peanuts, honey roasted almonds, and honey roasted Brussels sprouts. Next station stop is Edinburgh. We have plenty of amphibians pickled in brine to get you through those long nights. We have chicken eggs, we have alligator eggs, we have ostrich eggs. Ah, not for the faint of heart. Don't forget we're running a special on sludge this week. (laughs) Sludge... We've got orange sludge, green sludge, and at 50% off, the black sludge. If you forgot your toothbrush, we have whiskey. If you forgot your soap, we have gin. And if you forgot your blanket, we do have moonshine. Right here on the snack cart, right here at the midnight snack cart. Come and get get it. Uh, we take change. We take American Express. We do not take checks. Snack cart, get the highest snack on the cart here. We stop at the last station and hit up the SPCA. We've got cats and dogs, ladies and gentlemen, cats and dogs. We have a a special for buy one, get one half off if you get a cat and a dog. If you are questioning your existence on this long sleeve of car ride and you do not know who you are or where you are anymore, we do have peyote chocolate. We also have ketamine for those of you who indulge. Trains are considered international territory. Just a reminder, the chaplain will be around to perform random marriages. If anyone is interested in a random marriage, the chaplain will be around in about an hour. Please be aware if you are asleep and sleeping next to someone, he will marry you. (laughs) So if you go to bed a bachelor, you may wake up a wife. We we are fully stocked with false identities, new outlooks on life, and fragments of poetry which will haunt you until the end of your days. And for our special guests up in the front car sleepers, we have pints of regret. 
And just before it goes bad, we have priced these to move as quickly as possible. Get your podcasts. We have all of the past catalog and present episodes of Talk Tall to Me, which, as you know, is in fact a proud member of the Feckless Momes Audio Network. And they're not going back to London, so either buy them or we dump them. <laughs>